My name is David, and uh, you are joining Decred Australia, uh, which is myself, uh, Sa, who's also part of this call, and thankfully we've got Checkmate, who has moved back to Australia from London. Uh, and if you've been following Checkmate on Twitter and uh, his podcast that he's been involved with at Ready Set Crypto and other places, um, you would know that he is, uh, to say the least, maybe one of the masters when it comes to on-chain analysis. Uh, and today we're very fortunate that um, we're able to have something. And uh, by the way, I'm really glad that we've got so many international uh, people outside of Australia joining us today. Um, but it's great to have something that works for an Australian time zone uh, and that we can get some Australians involved in this as well. Uh, so without further ado, um, I'm going to hand it off now to Checkmate. Uh, he's got some excellent slides uh, and some excellent info to share with you all. And uh, once again, if you have anything that you'd like explained a little bit more clearly to you, or if you have a question, um, feel free to use the chat to ask those questions. Thank you very much. Checkmate, over to you. Thanks, David. Let me uh, let me just get my presentation sh my screen shared. Um, do let me know when this comes through. Um, thanks, everyone, for, for joining in. Um, Contrary to what David said, I wouldn't call myself a master. I just, I, I, in fact, I do tend to call myself uh, just a dude on the internet. Um, so do keep in mind that everything that I talk about is just me trying to understand the data. Um, my opinions and things are just that. They're my opinions. Don't use anything as, uh, you know, nothing as advice in any, any way, shape or form. Um, but what I do want to kind of get across is that there are useful things that you can um, discover by looking at these blockchain networks, looking at on-chain data. Um, so certainly use this as part of your toolkit to understanding the health of these networks. It's much the same as what you would do if you were doing due diligence um, for you know any any company or anything else in the world that you're you know you put much capital into. Um, blockchains are really no different. We know that they're fairly new and unique technology, um, and for the first time we can kind of see what's going on and the health of you know call it an equivalent to the internet, right? We can see the health of the internet occurring at every single block that gets uh, gets mined. Um, and each blockchain has its own unique characteristics. Um, they've all got their own unique um, uh, feature sets about them. Decred and Bitcoin are the two that uh, continue to draw my attention. Um, you know, Bitcoin has some of the most organic and, and, and to be perfectly honest, very, very impressive on-chain data and and, uh, and behavior responses to, to price and everything else um, and a very, very organic uh, path. So, you know, it, it, it truly is quite quite remarkable what you can pull out of the, uh, the Bitcoin uh, network. For, um, for Decred, because of its unique hybrid consensus model and the, you know, at the end of the day, it all comes down to the psychology of uh, people who are interacting with those networks, uh, forming the transactions of so the people behind every transaction. And for Bitcoin, because it has the network effects, it's a very different beast uh, to what, what Decred is, which is um, you can see the actual behavior and the psychology of people with Decred because of the ticket system. So for those who aren't familiar with the Decred ticket system, you basically bind up a, a number of coins. At the moment, it's about 140 DC, DCR worth for an indeterminate amount of time. So it could be anywhere between a couple of days and up to 142 days where you cannot access those coins. The result is that those coins are basically bound to the success, the price, everything of the chain. So with the hybrid consensus system, um, buying tickets is an extremely high conviction holding process. And with Bitcoin, basically, you know, we would look at something like the realized cap and we'll go through a lot of these metrics. Um, but the realized cap is basically if you were investing in Bitcoin, you would basically withdraw it from an exchange and it would sit in your wallet until the time comes that you want to spend it or, uh, or sell it. So um, the action of actually holding or the high conviction strong hand of Bitcoin is basically coins not moving. Um, for Decred, however, coins are moving all the time and the people who are moving them are the most high conviction holders. So the psychology behind a Decred transaction tends to be different to that of a Bitcoin transaction. So you can't actually directly apply things like the Realize cap um, directly from uh, Bitcoin. You need to actually go through a process of understanding what the human psychology and the network uh, technicals are before you can really appreciate what to do with that data. What does it actually mean if a coin is moving? So that's really what uh, on-chain analysis is is uh, supposed to do. It's supposed to kind of decipher down and 
um, and understand exactly what's going on with the people behind the network so that you can try and find edge, whether it's understanding when price is overvalued, undervalued, is there a lot of network activity relative to, uh, to um, the network value, things like that. If no one's using it and it's worth $4 billion, chances are it's overvalued and it's probably not a good thing to be holding on to. And conversely, when lots of people are demanding block space and the thing is priced uh, substantially lower, gives you an indication of undervaluation. So that's that's really what on-chain analysis is about. Um, so what I really wanted to do is take you through a couple of the charts um, that I keep an eye on uh, with great detail. Um, what you can see on the screen at the moment, um, I do a number of um, on-chain masterclasses, which is something I try to roll out one episode every uh, every quarter. Um, this is a this is the bones of one that I'm currently working on, but it's it's relevant. It's got the disclaimer and everything. But you can see the previous seven uh, modules that I've done, and this is for the community at Ready Set Crypto. Some of these we have um, behind our community paywall, um, and some of them we have uh, public on on RSC's YouTube channel. So they've got a in fact they've got a playlist uh, that we've set up um, that I believe has got about four or five of these modules up there, and I'm currently in the process of doing module seven. Um, which is kind of, you know, to be honest, you're kind of getting the, uh, the intro uh, to that with a specific focus on uh, on Bitcoin and Decred. So if you want any uh, any more information on this, either jump on Ready Set Crypto's um, YouTube channel where you can find those previous masterclasses um, or just flick me something on Twitter and I'll, I'll point you to them. So I might take you through to just kind of a bit of an update on, um, you know, this is kind of an amalgamation. So um as I go through this, I've got a number of different charts that I'll run through and kind of explain how I use them, what they're for, what they mean. Um, I've got a number that are for Bitcoins. Everything that's got a black background is Bitcoin. Everything that I've put in white is for Decred, uh, just so A, I don't get confused and B, it kind of makes it a bit clearer for everyone. Um, but this guy here is kind of, this is my, um, my main chart that I use for day-to-day -day activity. Now, um, this is basically lags by a day because it uses coin metrics data. Um, so pretty much everything I use here is just based off the coin metrics community profile. Um, so you can replicate a lot of this, uh, a lot of these calculations and things. And all my codes on GitHub and stuff. But um, this is so this will be missing today's candle. But it's you, as you can see, we picked up the uh, the thousand dollar green from yesterday. Um, now, this is basically an amalgamation of a whole bunch of models, and it's kind of similar to what Willy Wu has on his site, uh, where he has um, his pricing models. Um, I've kind of amalgamated all the ones that I tend to find provide strong bottoming signals or topping signals, um, and obviously color-coded green being very, very strong buy signals, and you can kind of expand this um, to go through Bitcoin's history. Um, and you can see that these dark green, as soon as price moves into these dark green levels, you really start getting some some value accumulation. You can see we slice in um, back down in May during the sell-off. So, and, and then yellow, as you, know, as you kind of move up, you're talking about more, you know, call it fair value type models or lower bounds. Um, and then there's a handful of models that obviously uh, do quite well at picking, you know, when you get extreme overvaluation signals. And to be perfectly fair, there's far more on-chain metrics than uh, than I have listed here. So there's, there's lots coming out there. Um, in general, I like to keep things relatively simple. So you'll even see on here that I've, I've got, you know, for example, 200 week moving averages. I really like the moving average, um, particularly on long time frames. In particular for Bitcoin, the 200 and the 128 daily and weekly uh, moving average both have significance. So, uh, oh, hang on, I broke it. Um, so, you know, moving averages, whilst they're not necessarily on-chain, um, understanding probabilities is really what on-chain metrics is all about. And um, in fact, if you if you go to uh, my Ready Set Crypto class on magic lines, that pretty much only focuses on um, fair value models, things like, uh, you know, stock to flow model and difficulty multiples and stuff like that. Um, but mostly it focuses on moving averages. What is the actual probability that price moves a certain distance away from the 200 or the 200 week or the 128 day? Um, what is the probability of it being so far away? Things like the Mayer multiple, um, which we'll get to shortly. So um, moving averages get a really nice kind of um, baseline understanding whereabouts we are in, in Bitcoin cycle. And it, it's kind of basing it off of uh, probabilistic history. So that's that's kind of the the bones for a lot of these models. Um, 
if we look at something like the realized price, um, in fact, let me just jump across to, uh, where is my realized price? Here we are. So the first kind of, I think it was probably one of the uh, the first really widespread, uh, wide adopted um, uh, on-chain metric came out of CoinMetrics, um, and that was the realized price. So the fundamental calculation behind the realized price, which you can see in blue uh, versus Bitcoin in price in white, is every single time a UTXO is created or somebody sends a transaction and coins are moved um, of any denomination, they basically get repriced at the at exactly the uh, the price it was when they got sent. So um, if a whole bunch of coins moved today, uh, I, I think that what they probably do is they, they'd go through, they'd look at how many coins moved on a particular day, whatever the closing price is, they then say, okay, all those coins are now set at that price. Now, if those coins don't move, so if somebody bought Bitcoin back here when price was down at 10 bucks and they didn't move it until the 2017 bull run, right, right up here at 20,000, that coin is, or the realized price, and you can see in blue, it's always uh, or generally sits below the price. Um, that means that the coins haven't moved. When they move from the $10 price point, so they were bought here, if they are then sold up here at the peak, they get repriced from $10 to $20,000. So if they move, say, 15 coins, those 15 coins go from a $10 price to a $20,000 price. And you can see during the bull run, it basically that indicates selling. And what you get here is that basically an acceleration in the realized price. As all those coins get repriced, as they, you know, the old coins start moving, they get repriced and you get this elevation in the realized floor. Now, the other way to think about it from a psychological perspective is if you buy a coin on an exchange and you withdraw it, you can consider yourself saving that value, right? You have saved X amount of dollars in Bitcoin. Um, that's really what the realized price is capturing. It's capturing when was the last time every coin moved. And if we assume that every the last time it moved was when somebody invested and saved their value in it, kind of comes back to the narrative of storing value. Um, the realized price kind of shows the average cost basis. What did everyone pay for their coins, right? Um, and you can actually see that as we move into, you know, zones like, below this price floor here, where's my rectangle? No, um, this guy here, this guy here, this guy here, and for a very, very brief moment, this guy here, um, when price moves below that price floor, uh, the realized price floor, what it's basically saying is that the entire market is now on average cost basis underwater. So, um, and you can see here that it's basically aligned with all of the major capitulation levels um, you know, you have your initial capitulation when it falls under and then it basically retested, retested and then finally broke above and then away it goes. We had the same scoop down here and we had the same scoop down here. So it's kind of the, uh, it's a value position when price falls underneath the realized price. And if you just take a ratio between these two, you can, you basically come up with the MVRV ratio, which is what you can see in orange down here. And under that same circumstance, anything below of a ratio below one, right, meaning it's below the realized price, you end up in a value zone. Same as what you've got here, and then same as what you've got here. So you can basically identify periods of undervaluation. Um, and the reason being, because you can see the psychology, where did everybody buy their coins? Now, what this doesn't pick up is what's going on on exchanges. So you, there's a lot of, you know, with these real, these um, on-chain metrics, it's a single feed into your data set, right? It's, it's one particular input, and there's lots of these things, um, but you won't see any of the activity that's going on on exchanges. Now, in a way, this is actually really important for Bitcoin because um, any coins that are basically on, trading on exchange, they can easily be sold. Right, they just become part of the uh, you know uh, the day trading noise. There's a lot of emotion and speculation, all sorts of stuff that goes on on exchanges. When you withdraw those coins, it's a very very strong signal that you intend to hold on to them. And what you know the Coin Metrics team saw during this particular sell off the other day, one of their um, newsletters, state of the state of the network, um, they they basically picked up that if you look at what was going on on chain it was basically coins that moved in the last 30 to 90 days that sold this. None of the coins that actually um, you know, were purchased back here, 
back here, anywhere below this, none of these coins or a very small portion of them were sold during that capitulation. And the outcome that you, or the, the conclusion you can draw from that is that the strong hands held, the weak hands sold. And the vast majority of the volume actually was on exchange rather than on chain. We didn't get a very high on chain signature during this whole process. So it kind of gives you a bit of a confidence boost that the strong hands actually stepped in and uh, and and were quite, you know um, happy to basically take it off the weak hands. So um, the MVRV ratio is a, is a really powerful metric. Um, and likewise, from picking um, you know value points at the bottom, and you can see we just dipped in here. Um, you can also look for areas where you start historically, right? When you start reaching um, in the early days, it's a little bit, a uh, little bit more challenging. But um, you can see where you start getting these value positions um, to actually start exiting the market. And again, this is all kind of based on historical probabilities. None of these numbers and values are, uh, are exact levels. Um, so you know what what actually constitutes a dark red and a light red zone is uh, is kind of up for debate. Um, I kind of set my levels and you can actually see that over time, let me get rid of some of these lines, you can actually see that over time we're starting to squeeze in, right? You've got um, a, a gradual squeezing in of these two lines. You see this across many of the metrics we're about to go through. Um, and it's basically a signal of market maturity, right? We're getting over time less volatility, more participants, uh, a lot more derivatives, a lot more things that are moving price around. but. Um, in general, we're seeing this kind of squeezing in. So look, it could be that these levels actually need to start coming down. It could be they need to be on slope. But um, really, if you look, if you think about it from the psychology, when price really deviates above the cost basis, it's probably a good time. You know, a lot of people are now in profit. And when a lot of people are in profit, it's potentially a good opportunity to actually realize some of those gains. So these these metrics work both to the downside, looking for value, and to the upside, when you start looking at, all right, when are we getting a little bit euphoric and when can we probably start taking some off the table? Um, so a really nif kind of take um, following on from that, uh, let me clear that. Um, this is a metric that's been, it's been around for quite a while. I forget who originally authored it, but I know that Glassnode recently updated this on uh, on their website. Um, and I've, I basically built this the other day off, uh, off their levels. Um, this is basically the same metric so this is looking at how far, basically, what is the actual um, uh, relative profit level? How far away has price deviated from the realized price? Now, when we're below a level of zero, of, uh, of zero right? So this is this is kind of our baseline. So anytime it falls under that line here, where we're talking about these red capitulation zones, which we just kind of spoke about. Um, but you can actually see that up here, we're getting points of very, very high relative profit, right? Which we're calling euphoria and greed. Um, when you're in the green zone, I mean, if you started paying attention up here and thinking, all right, we might be starting to get to uh, some slightly oversold conditions and you wait for the blue to show up, you could very well be getting out at the top, right? Very few metrics, um, you know, even trading indicators, I mean, the volatility that's going on up in these top sections is, is crazy. Um, when you actually zoom in and look at what went on during this particular price top up in uh, 2017, we were talking about a $10,000 range trading in you know $6,000 increments every couple of days. So to actually identify this as the top um, based on technical analysis would be challenging. However, if you were looking at a number of these metrics, you would pretty much be, you know, you'd be able to set a fairly good basis and say, well, it's probably not a bad time to be at least taking some profits. And at the end of the day, you actually would have been picking up that signal here, right? And you may not have weathered this whole whole uh, mess. So, you know, it's, it's one of those tools that shows you how far, how much profit is actually in the system based on the on-chain behavior. Um, now, as with all of these metrics, a thing to kind of keep in your back pocket um, is that this will change over time. Right, the the actual levels and the performance and how the chain is used will cha will change over time. Um, we're seeing already that a lot more coins are being deposited and left on exchange. Uh, we're seeing more custodians coming in. Um, the the behavior of Bitcoin and any crypto asset is going to change over time. Narratives shift. Um, you know what use cases exist, and you know everything else moves around. So, 
it's, a, it's, it's something to keep in mind that the levels will change. But again, we look back at history and we say, okay, where were the profit levels? Where were the value levels uh, in past cycles? Um, and what does, for example, realized price, which is kind of the, uh, the psychological um, uh, cost basis for the whole market, what does the distance of price away from that level tell us about this kind of thing? Um, and j just for everyone that's kind of listening, if, if you are looking for these particular, let me just bring up uh, my slide. If you're looking for these charts in the wild, um, it's, a pro it's, it's something we're actually starting to try and build up a, uh, a site as we speak that will um, have my actual charts uh, built up. But if you're looking for things in the intermediate, there's there's a number of different sites uh, which I've got up here, um, uh, which you can actually access the vast majority of these on-chain metrics. So there's uh, you know there's a whole lot of different charting packages, and to be honest, there's one popping up every couple of weeks. So uh, you know th these are some of the ones that I use or did use until I started building this guy. So that's a uh, that's a work in progress to uh, look forward to. So we can actually apply pretty much the same logic. If you move to Decred, um, the, the big difference between Decred and Bitcoin when it comes to the realized price, as I was saying before, that coins are always moving for Decred. So because coins are always moving, rather than Bitcoin where you basically have these long periods of plateau, right? you've got these long plateaus where it doesn't do much, and then you get a change in gradient, and this here means old coins are moving. This here means old coins are being repriced and moving. This here means that coins are not really moving on on uh, on chain. So this generally, when you get these plateaus, it generally lines up with relatively low on chain activity. There's not a great deal going on. Coins from that were bought back here are not being repriced up here, which means they're not moving. Now for Decred, it's a very very different mechanism because the coins are moving all the time. Um, you actually end up in a situation where um, during a bull market. So let's just define this guy here as our bull market, and then this guy here as our bear market, all right, down, up. Um, you can see here that the realized price tends to act more like a support level. So if we, the, the same logic applies, it's kind of the, the cost basis. Somebody will only buy a ticket when they believe that it's got further to go, right? They still think that I would rather, I, I want to bind my coins up to the chain. I want the uh, the staking reward. I want to commit to governance. I, I believe in the project, whatever it is, whatever strong hand action or psychology that goes behind it, the realized price is showing us that at this level, people are still willing to move their coins. So during a bull market, it actually behaves more as a support level. Now, the converse is also true. When the market flips, right? And as of this point here, we basically moved into a bearish market. You actually see that the converse is true. So we we're the initial break below and almost from that point onwards, the realized price has acted as a resistance level pretty much to this day. So, um, and this could be for a number of things, right? It could be that people are basically, you know, um, down here, you can actually see that the realized price had a very low uh, declining gradient. That actually means a lot of coins are moving, right? Because price is now lower and the realized price is actually accelerating in its dip, it actually means that down in this zone here, there's either a lot of tickets or there's a lot of accumulation. So the gradient of this line here is actually very important because it indicates potentially what is the smart money doing, right? So, um, and there's a number of other metrics we can kind of talk about, but um, there's a fairly good case to be made that the smart money really did accumulate quite a lot of DCR in this zone. And you can actually see during this zone here, we have more or less the same, same situation going on. So during periods of very, very high on-chain activity, and sorry, this, this is not only smart money accumulating, because there's one person on every side of that trade, this is also weak hands capitulating, right? So you've got both sides of the equation going on, you need one to swap for the other. Um, so during periods of very high on-chain activity, the realized price will snap towards the actual price because you've got a lot of coins moving, there's a gravity to, for the realized price to move towards the, uh, uh, towards the spot price. Um, so for um, Decred, when you move into the um, MVRV ratio, 
you can see the same thing, right? We've got our, our unity line, right? This is um, uh, price equals realized price. And you can see there's a buy level, there's a buy level, right? You can use this thing as a support level. We now swap to a bear market and there is your resistance level, right? So in theory, you could pick up there, sell there. You could pick up there, you could sell there, right? You can use these oscillators and the psychology of the market to actually, you know, you, you can trade decred, even though it's got a, a, you know, in terms of liquidity, it's one of those things that continues to, uh, um, it's developing. Um, these metrics actually provide a fairly sound basis for people to actually get in there and actually, um, uh, you know, play within these swings because it suggests when you've got um, uh, periods of over and undervaluation that perform quite differently to what Bitcoin does. You know, if we go back to what Bitcoin is doing, um, I mean, in terms of how often you get an MVRV signal, you're talking about one, two, three, four, maybe five sell signals, and one, two, three, four. In the entire 11 years of Bitcoin's history, you've got 10 different signals. Now, when you move on to a chain like Decred, you can see that we actually have a, a, quite a substantial number of the signals that start to come into it. And that is because the realized price behaves very differently to how Bitcoin does. Um, and, you know, it, it kind of comes down to understanding exactly what the psychology behind this metric is um, to give you an understanding about what's going on. And in a very similar vein, if we look at the unrealized profit loss, this is again taking the, um, uh, taking the current price minus the realized price. What is the distance between um, you know, when the coins last moved and when they were, um, you know, uh, when they've been repriced as kind of the, the average cost basis, you get very similar things, right? You look for these zones where you've got these capitulation points, um, high, high conviction values, um, normally characterized by dipping in the realized price. And likewise, you get these peaks, um, which you can basically pick up uh, from how far away has, has price extended too far from the mean. So the realized price, you can kind of think for Decred as it's a support support level in bulls, resistance level in bears. Um, but overall, because coins are always moving, it's basically the mean, right? So people talk about reversion to the mean. Price will always revert back to the mean, um, you know, unless any of these networks go to zero and then call it a day. Um, another one that's really useful, and I think we're all going to get a, a fairly... In, you know, this, this, this chart in particular is going to get pretty exciting in uh, about 11, 11 days' time. So we all know the halvings coming up. And what this is here is this is the difficulty ribbon. Now, let me just take off some of this noise that we don't need. Um, what the difficulty ribbon is, is um, the protocol difficulty for miners um, indicates how hard the puzzle is that they need to solve. Right? So the miners are there computing away, trying to solve the next block. Now, the more miners that show up, the more, so if you get a whole lot of miners into the into the, um, the field, the difficulty will automatically wind itself up and make the puzzle harder to try and target that in Bitcoin 10 minute block time and Decred five minute block time. So the difficulty will always be adjusting depending on how many miners enter the fold. Conversely, if a whole bunch of miners capitulate and they just have to exit the market, right? or their hardware is now outdated, or for whatever reason, they've gone broke, whatever the reason is, if a miner leaves the network, their hash power is removed, and the entire network will then self-correct down. So what happens is you get this, this kind of uh, self-equilibrating system that uh, is, is truly one of the most impressive things that Satoshi uh, pulled into Bitcoin. Um, it, it's such a simple but remarkable design feature that the protocol will, if you are an over-leveraged miner, you better believe that that difficulty adjustment every 14 days is going to make you pay for your sins. So um, what the difficulty ribbon does is just take a bunch of uh, moving averages, um, you know, 9, 14, 28, 50, 100, 120. Um, it's basically a series of moving averages. And for any of you who kind of look at charts and, and use um, uh, moving average ribbons, um, what you're looking for is changes in momentum. And you can see, let's just take this kind of first phase. You can see that because the ribbon here is quite stretched, it basically means that um, the actual protocol difficulty, which is in dark green, 
is accelerating faster than the two the slow moving 200 day moving average right it takes time for the 200 day to catch up to reality whereas the nine and the, the 28 and whatever these faster moving averages they hug quite tightly right so they're basically following what's going on so during hash rate expansion which is what we would kind of call this zone here you are getting an increase right more miners are coming online likewise this zone here you've got more miners coming online and that's generally supported by an increase in price right as price increases you get a expansion of the mining industry right even though the the block reward goes down there's more us dollar denominator value to be shared amongst the miners and when the incentive is there if somebody's buying hash power with uh, sorry buying bitcoin with hash power at 99 dollars for a you know for a hundred dollars worth of value someone's going to step in and try and bid 99.1 and then someone else is going to step in and bid 99.2 so the profit margin gets squeezed and that's what happens you get this expansion of miners coming in to take advantage of the entirety of the block reward that's on on, on offer now the converse is a true when you get these periods where you know price maybe takes a 90 percent drawdown you know which we're all pretty used to uh, to weathering by this point um, you get these substantial drawdowns all the miners who go hey this is a great time for me to jump on board and i'm going to add a whole lot of ha hash power suddenly price is not in their favor when price drops it means that there's less us dollar denominator block reward to go around and more of these miners are now going to be mining at a loss now no one particularly wants to just burn money so at some point in time those miners are going to go that's it i'm, I'm, I'm throwing it in i'm throwing in the towel I'm walking away, um, selling all my rigs, I'm out. Now, that will reduce the difficulty. And that's what we see here. In the um, core protocol difficulty, suddenly plateaus and dips. This zone here is because a whole lot of miners just turned off and you get a compress, right? The, the, the difficulty ribbon squeezes in on itself because the 200 day catches up. Um, the, the, the actual difficulty drops below the 200 day this is a period of minor capitulation. And what you actually are looking for is the point when the difficulty kicks back up, right? That there is a value position, right? And that's because the difficulty, the miners are now picking up enough value and miners tend to put the bottom in for these markets. You can see a very similar effect here. This is kind of the point when the difficulty started to kick up and started to creep up. In the rear view mirror, not a bad little entry, right? Same thing here. When the difficulty ribbon starts to kick back up, you get the initial capitulation. Difficulty starts to pick back up. Historically speaking, not a bad little entry. So it really does put credence to the notion that miners will put the bottom in. Now, the mechanics behind why that happens is you've got a certain amount of coins being issued every 10 minutes or five minutes, whatever it is. There's a certain amount of value being issued by the protocol. When the whole bunch of miners, the weak miners, the people who over leverage, who have you know, um, expensive power or they've got very poor capital controls, right? They, they've got a bad loan or whatever it is. Whatever reason it is that they're going out of business, those weak hands, when they sell, like they've got a, they've been mining coins, right? They just sell their inventory. They've got to pay back their investors. They've got to exit. They've got to sell their hardware, whatever it is. They've got to recuperate costs. Um, those weak miners reduce the hash power. Now, if you're a strong miner and you're still ticking along, right, your machines are still humming because you've got better power, you've got a better power contract, you've got, um, you know, you're running next-gen hardware, whatever it is that puts you as a more competitive miner, your share of the total pool of hash power when your mate drops off goes up, right? You've just claimed a larger stake in the network hash. Now, that means that when you will be winning more coins, you know, it's all probabilistic, but you'll be winning more coins on average which means if your costs remain the same, you're gonna have more coins that you don't need to sell. Now, miners with their ASICs are the most hardcore hodlers that are out there, right? They are people who have committed substantial costs. I mean, those ASICs are worthless, right? Without, without Bitcoin or Decred humming away, those ASICs are worthless, big paperweights. So they are the most hardcore hodlers out of anyone. Doesn't matter how strong your hand is, a miner is stronger. Now, they're going to be hanging on to those coins because they believe in the value proposition, right? They believe that these things are undervalued to a great extent. So when the weak miner drops off, your strong hash power steps up, you sell less coins, 
that all the coins that were being sold by the wheat mine are now being held. You then amplify that across the entire network. And this is why miners put the bottom in because the weak miners drop off, the strong miners gain hash power and they start hodling. And that puts an artificial or a, you know, a, a legitimate um, constraint on the supply, right? It's like gold miners hoarding the gold that they mine because they believe price is gonna go up. Um, it's why they keep bullying on their balance sheets, right? They believe in where gold is going. Um, same can be said for Bitcoin and probably even more so. So we can, that, that's kind of the concept, but you can use the difficulty ribbon to look for minor stress. Where are the miners really having a hard time? And when they start to recover, and uh, you know, that, that's a good value proposition. And what we're gonna see over here, right? Day 11 um, is because the block reward's gonna halve, there's a very, very good reason to believe that we're going to lose 40%, maybe. I think the you know some of the smart money. To be honest, the uh, the recent price jump is going to be a welcome. Uh, the higher price goes, the less miners have to bail out. But we are going to see a drawdown in mining, right? Hash power is going to go down. Um, and that's not a bad thing. If you look at all of these past occurrences when hash rate has really dropped down, it's actually a really, really good time to be thinking about where does it go from here? So, you know, miners put the bottom in. And um, when it comes to Decred, it has pretty much the exact same mechanics. The big difference with Decred is um, for Bitcoin, because of its first mover advantage, when Bitcoin ASICs came out in 2012, in fact, sorry, let me just jump back here for, uh, for clarity. Um, Bitcoin's ASICs showed up here, right? Basically, we had the drawdown during this time. The technology got built. ASIC show up here, and you can actually see this is the ASIC expansion. This um, jump in, in uh, protocol difficulty, and we're talking about one, two, three, four, five. You could almost argue six orders of magnitude of hash power gained um, relative to one, two, three orders of magnitude of price, right? So this difficulty adjustment is almost entirely driven by ASICs, right? We had a threefold increase in price, uh, you know, a hundred um, X increase in price, but we had six orders of magnitude worth of hash power. Um, and because ASICs are very capital intensive, for Decred, we have a very, very different system. And I covered this in, uh, in one of the papers I did recently. So for Decred, that point right there, that is when the ASICs launched, um, start of 2018. So you can see the same hash rate expansion. Now, the problem is, look what happened to price, right? We, we basically entered the bear market on the exact day that ASICs launched. So contrary to what happened in Bitcoin, where a whole lot of ASIC manufacturers, a whole lot of uh, miners invested in this hardware, and then they had a raging bull market with 100x um, uh, gains in price to pay off all of their, their coins and pay off their hardware and expenses. For Decred, we had the complete opposite. We've actually had extremely challenging financial conditions for, for mining, even though they've already invested in the hardware, right? This is a sunk cost. They have already paid for these, this hardware. You can see the hash rate expanded, but you can also see the length of this uh, difficulty squeeze. We had a similar one back here, but the uh, the mining conditions were a little bit different. It was being dual mined with Ethereum back in these days. Um, and it, it, kind of the crux of where this is going, um, during this phase, right, this phase of Decred's history, it was basically GPU miners, dual mining with Ethereum. And Dave Collins did a great study where he actually looked at where those coins were going and they were pretty much selling them immediately, right? Ethereum miners did not care. They sold the coins almost immediately. Now that's actually a really, really good thing. Because of Decred's consensus mechanism with the um, hybrid proof of work, proof of stake, what this whole zone represented was a mass distribution. Miners did not care, they were selling their coins. I mean, sorry, this is my interpretation. It could be different, but this is my gut feel. Um, miners on gen in general um, were clearing coins. That means that all of those coins have been distributed and when it comes to a you know we talk about all these fair launches and everything else but when we have to look at things objectively this is a really bullish thing it, in my personal opinion this is really bullish i like the fact that coins got distributed on mass and you've got to remember that during these early days right the first two years um 
we're talking about the great inflation. When you look at um, Decred and Bitcoin and any other um, of these projects, supply curves, the first two to five years um, is in particular, very, very high levels of inflation. So what's important is that during this period of time, those coins are being distributed and sold en masse, which is really good as far as I'm concerned. Now, the second phase of Decred's history is the post ASIC world. And that is where the miners have basically been under really, really savage financial stress. I mean, we're talking about dropping from a, what is this price point? I think this is up at 120 bucks, 80, dollars um, down into, you know, $12, $14 where we are today. So this entire period through here, again, is a massive distribution period. So at the core of all of this, the actual distribution of DCR, you almost couldn't argue it has been, you know, it's been fair in almost every regard um, because you've had miners that are basically, you know, it, it accounts for some of the sell pressure because miners are trying to pay off their ASICs and, and everything else. So my personal read on a lot of this price action is it's actually miners continually selling because they just haven't had the price appreciation to pay off their expensive hardware. Now, there's going to come a point in time when that hardware doesn't matter, you know, they keep burning electricity, but it's a sunk cost. Um, the only time that a miner will have to just completely capitulate is when their finances, right, the capital costs for the ASICs and everything else just becomes too much for them to handle, um, or um, their power cost, right, price no longer supports even the, op the OPEX. At some point in time, I, and we actually saw, we're seeing this uh, and have done for a while, this capitulation period is miners having to turn off their rigs. Now, at some point, those strong miners will gain enough hash power that they have to stop, like they can stop selling, right? And you end up with the same difficulty mechanism squeeze where you get a constraint on supply. So again, no one knows what actually happens um, from this point onwards. Um, all we can do is look at kind of the mechanisms and the, the psychology of what's going on. Um, but this is really what the power of the, uh, the difficulty ribbon is and how it kind of gives you an insight into what's going on in the mining space. And similar to what we did for MVRV, you can then take the, uh, the pure multiple. Pure multiple is what is the USD block reward coming in and what is the 365 day average of that? Now, the reason that's important, miners are long-term thinkers. So you have to think about, um, hang on, give me one second. Let me just get rid of that noise. Right, sorry about that. Um, so because miners are long-term thinkers, um, they care about their, you know, running 365, it's kind of their, their average um, income. It's what they use for their planning and modeling and everything else. Um, so the pure multiple just basically takes the, the ratio of those. And again, you start seeing for Bitcoin, um, points of exit, points of entry, right? You start thinking about where are the miners under stress and where are they having a field day, right? Up here, miners are loving life. Um, good time to be getting out because they're, uh, you know, they're mining at a substantial profit. There's probably going to be a good, good amount of supply they're going to be unloading onto the market. Down here, weak miners are really, really under financial stress, and it's fairly likely they'll start dropping off the radar soon, and the strong miners will start constraining supply. Um, exact same mechanism exists for uh, for decred, right? And again, we have to kind of wait and see how this plays out over multiple cycles but you have a fairly similar, uh, similar story where you've got these you know, points of absolute euphoria, everyone's having a field day, right? And you've got these points of, um, and sorry, to be fair, the pure multiple will have more relevance from this point onwards because this is ASIC territory, right? So the income stream over 365 days really matters for miners with ASICs, GPU space, not quite as relevant. But at the same time, you can still look at things like, you know, historic fractals and use those as value points, right? So same concepts apply. Um, I might run through just one more model, one more set of models, um, which is kind of more demand focused, and then we might open it up for questions. I mean, I've got more charts and we can we can possibly go through in a day, but you know, I'm happy to do multiple of these sessions. Um, now, this is an interesting set of metrics. So the NVT and RVT ratio is something that got a lot of traction back in 2017. Uh, a lot of people were starting to explore these models and, and what it means. 
Um, what it basically takes is the daily transaction volume and it divides it by either spot price for the or market cap, sorry, for the NVT or the realized price for the RVT. Um, and there's a whole course I've done on RSC YouTube uh, on these particular metrics. Now, what the ratio over here is basically showing you is that at a value of 10, it means that the decred, uh, sorry, the Bitcoin or the decred market cap is 10 times larger than the daily transaction volume. So it's settling about 10% of its market cap uh, every day. Up here, it's settling, you know, um, the market cap is 40 times larger than the amount it's settling. So perhaps counterintuitively, but higher values um, suggest that there's basically not a lot of network, there's not a lot of network traffic, not a lot of people are using it. The utility is low relative to the, uh, sorry, the utility is low and it should be, it, the, the network is overvalued, right? Not many people are using it it's probably overvalued. Conversely, when you move down into these low zones, I mean, if any system, right, if Visa was settling 10 times, um, 10 times its, uh, its, its market cap, uh, or sorry, settling its market cap every 10 days, that's probably another way to look at it, every 10 days it settles its total network value, it's pretty impressive. Now, you can see that for Bitcoin's bull markets, we basically sit in the zone under 10, in particular the RVT. I like the RVT a lot more than the MVT because it's comparing one on-chain metric, the realized price, to another on-chain metric, daily transaction volume. Um, NVT, this guy is subject to, and the yellows, um, is subject to everything that's going on in exchanges because it uses um, spot price, right? And derivatives and all that kind of stuff. Um, the RVT is much, much higher conviction. It's a slower moving beast. Um, you can see that you can even see here where it lags. So NVT broke up above here. RVT took a lot longer. You'd be selling here rather than up here. Um, so the RVT is a slower moving but higher conviction signal. Uh, but it's it's it maintains its val validity for longer because it's comparing on-chain to on-chain. So it's kind of like for like. Um, so for Bitcoin, basically anything where you're talking about an under 10, you know, it's good days, right? Happy days. Anything under 10, you're talking about a bull market. What's really, really interesting is that during this period of time, pretty much since um, since the peak, we've had very, very low on-chain transaction volume relative to Bitcoin's market price, relative to its market cap, sorry. Um, now, this is partly going on because of, you know, there's more derivatives. I, I think a lot of these traders, a lot of traders are no longer using uh, Bitcoin to move around because they've got derivatives and options and futures and things. Um, Tether has also moved off chain and Tether was a fairly substantial um, pull for block space. Um, so in general, this is actually not an overly bullish signal. Um, there's a lot of people who like to argue that the MVT, RVT, they're losing their signal, blah, blah, blah. But why is it losing its signal? It's because people are not holding their coins. People are not transacting with it, right? So to be perfectly honest, this is really the thing that I'm not super keen on. Everything else in Bitcoin right now, I mean, it's just a raging tick, right? Everything else is in undervalued slash has bounced well and truly out of it. This guy here, um, both because of the um, the fact that there's no, we're not getting signal, if we got a stack of transactions, and I was really excited right here because I thought this was going to be, and this is here, right? I thought this was going to be the genesis of the next real move, right? I thought that we were we were good to go. And when I started to get a little bit nervous, and in fact, there's a video I put out back in June, I think, 2019. Um, I think it was about here where I said, I'm not, I'm not pleased with what I'm seeing here with this reversal. This gives me pause. And lo and behold, we basically had a sell-off after that point. So a lot of people will say the NVT, RVT doesn't have signal. I say that not having signal is a signal, right? If you're not getting on-chain transactions, why? It either means that people aren't using the network or people are not withdrawing their coins and they're sitting on exchange balances um, or other custodial solutions. And really that's not what Bitcoin is kind of for, right? It is that bare asset and it's there to be used. Um, it could just be that this is some hardcore hodling and no one's using it, we don't know. And that's why we kind of combine a number of these metrics. But at the moment, this is the only metric that's giving me a little bit of pause regarding uh, regarding Bitcoin. But again, there's a lot of other elements and features and, and reasons for that. I think Tether is a big one, to be perfectly honest. Um, and just to kind of wrap up um, for this first phase, then we'll go to some questions. 
Um, for Decred, um, quite the opposite, quite the opposite story. And the reason being because Decred, as we've said, is a very, very on-chain heavy um, uh, project, right? You've got tickets that are always moving. You've got um, transactions for votes. You've got lots of things going on that keep Decred ticking over that require on-chain. And the other thing is, you know, privacy mixing and come in with the DEX and all these other features. It's it, Decred has always been an on-chain focused project. Now, I will say that we do need, and this is the same for many Decred metrics, we do need actually a whole cycle to play out before we can really draw a lot of conclusions, right? A lot of these um, levels and you know value zones I've picked up are based on kind of the four years we've had, and we can't ignore the fact that Decred remains fairly tethered to Bitcoin and the rest of the market. So, you know, really this bear market, this wasn't Decred's doing, this was the market's doing, right? This is, it, it's kind of a being tugged along for this journey. So there's a lot of things that Decred had to weather that um, are kind of an externality or just part of the market that it's in. But in a very similar case, I like the amount of transaction volume that we've got going on down here. Um, you can see that during these phases, then this was bullish territory. This point here resulted in, you know, I think this was 100% move. So you know, it's hard, easy to get lost in the scale of all this, but you know, I think this was 100% move. And I like this, right? People are using the chain. People are actually transacting on it. Um, it's something that really I'm not seeing across a lot of other metrics. I think um, Permanent Nino has looked at Ethereum a bit and there's there's transactions going on there. But between Ethereum and uh, and Decred, that's kind of where the transaction activity is going on right now. Um, I'm fairly confident that the privacy mixing has, uh, it's got a lot of demand. Um, I started pulling out um, some numbers for that. In fact, I might even have uh, the code for that somewhere if you can bear with me uh where are we if you've got any questions because we're starting to wrap up um feel free to stick them into the um into the chat room and i'll get to them shortly uh what was i looking for privacy metrics Uh, hopefully that runs and I haven't broken it. Um, but the privacy um, implementation has really added a new layer of, uh, of blockchain demand, right? There's people who want to use um, the privacy mix. I can only imagine that once we start, uh, once it comes into the, the GUI, we're going to have even more, more demand for that. Um, but you can see here, this guy here is basically saying that the total amount of coins, um, so just for context, let me just uh, put some... Um, in... Um, so this is basically in terms of total supply, cumulative on-chain volume that's going on. Um, orange is just regular transactions. Green is uh, ticket transactions. And this explosion of red is basically the privacy demand. And at the moment, we're talking about about 20 million DCR that have been mixed and have not been spent. So it, this doesn't even include coins that have been mixed and then spent, right? So this only includes coins that have been mixed and that are sitting stationary. Um, and this guy here is basically saying that 20, that accounts for 23% of the entire supply. So there's a fairly substantial demand for block space coming from the privacy mix. And uh, I put out a tweet a little while back, you know, lots of Bitcoiners were touting, you know, Wasabi having mixed or a Samurai, I can't remember which one it was, um, you know, having mixed a couple of thousand uh, Bitcoin over the last month. Decred's mixing 100,000 DCR a day. So the scale of coins that are actually moving on chain kind of gives you a bit of an indication here that there's there's demand for block space and that demand is not only coming from tickets and staking which is by my estimation a uh, you know the strongest uh, draw card um, but the privacy uh, element is really adding that value and then when you add the DEX as well what I'm really excited about uh, for the longer term with Decred is if we keep getting fairly substantial on-chain um, demand for block space and features that require it this is really good for the 21 million supply and building a fee market, right? This excites me. What doesn't excite me is this. I really don't like that we're losing on-chain transaction volume and people like to say the MVT doesn't work. I think that no signal is the signal that the MVT is telling us. I'm not overly excited by it. Um, I'm happy to be proven wrong. You know, I'm a long-term Bitcoin bull. Um, I do want to see more transactions going on on chain. Now, the other thing is this could also be part of the fact that Bitcoin is just getting much, much larger. I and mean, we're talking about, sorry, this is price. 
Um, but we're talking about 200 billion market cap. If we, if the thing keeps going, we could be talking about trillions of dollars at some point. Um, to be moving trillions of dollars on a regular basis um, is it's a lot of money. So um, I do expect that this green level, what I would deem as green, will slowly move up. Right? It will move up because the network gets larger. There's only so many dollars and value that wants to get settled on a particular day. Um, so these numbers are dynamic, but it's the trend. Right? It's all about the trend. I want to see this plateau or I want to see this coming down, particularly when we're in the same market cap range, right? I really want, and, and look, the bull market's coming, um, ideally, uh, or we hope, and, you know, I really want to see an accelerate. I don't want to see an acceleration because that's bearish. I want to see this guy here. I want to see a decline. I want to see more transaction volume relative to its market cap, showing that it's undervalued, and this will give me a lot more confidence in this guy. For Decred, it's smaller, right? It's got a long way to go. We can't ignore that. But I like the amount of demand that's being built up on chain. Um, and, you know, when you understand these two deltas between what is going on with a Bitcoin transaction, what is going on with a Decred transaction, these metrics that talk about, um, you know, uh, what is the relative value between transaction and, um, uh, and network value kind of comes to a little bit more light. So... Anyway, that was a lot of me rambling and talking about stuff. Um, hopefully, there's something in there that you can kind of pull from it. Um, I don't expect anyone to absorb, you know, everything at once. This has certainly been multiple years of me kind of thinking about this to, to come to even a fraction of these conclusions. Um, there's a lot of interesting data out there. What I'm really hoping, and a couple of the guys that I saw join this chat room, in fact, are um, helping me build up a website that will host all of these charts. Um, it will include a whole lot of descriptions and what I kind of want it to be is a bit of an education center um, so people can look at these things and learn from it and there's you know somewhere that you can read our blogs and um, so myself and Pernbull Nino and I'm sure others will have uh, insights that come into it but um, that's really where we want to get to with this thing um, and you know when it comes to Bitcoin and Decred they're certainly the two chains that that really excite me from an on-chain perspective as, uh, as nerdy and sad as that sounds but there's a, there's a lot of good signal coming through here. And to be perfectly honest, the people who understand, you, I mean, you've already seen some of the value points that you can identify, tops and bottoms. Um, and really, this is just scratching the surface. So for people who are there for the long hold, this kind of toolkit is really how you identify, are you in the right ballpark? Um, and the, you know, understanding the health of the network as it goes. So... Anyway, that's kind of uh, kind of it from me. Are there any questions? If you've got questions or things, feel free to shout on the uh, either the text chat or uh, come in live. Yeah, uh, I just um, I'm just going to come in with my voice in a moment. Please, uh, if you feel more comfortable using the chat, feel free to do that so we're not talking over each other. But I wanted to sort of jump in quickly. Firstly, say thank you. Uh, so far, it's been incredible i'm glad we recorded this because i'd like to go over it again but i do have a couple of questions myself uh, if you don't mind stupid. um okay so and 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 you know i'm a believer of there is no such thing as a stupid question yep. uh maybe what i'm going to be asking right now some may think is a stupid question but um before when you were looking at uh if we go back to the bitcoin nbt rbt ratio yep um now we're talking about that sort of you know january 2018 onwards where People are starting to argue that there is no signal there or, you know, um, I'm wondering what are your thoughts on the impact of something like, uh, well, let's say Lightning Network and settlements and on-chain transactions. Do you think that's had an impact on these signals here? Um, so Lightning Network will have an impact. However, Lightning Network still has uh, a sign-in, sign-out transaction, right? So you need to get coins onto LN. Um, once they're on LN, Absolutely, we would expect more to be moving off chain. Now, if we also anticipate that, you know, let, let's assume the price goes where I think we all want it to go, um, the US dollar denomination of fees will get very high, which will push more people onto Lightning Network. And there's a place for both Bitcoin and Decred. Um, it is good to have that versatility and kind of the delta between those two is that on chain um, cares about uh, UTXO size in bytes. LN cares about how much you're settling. So for somebody who's sending a billion dollars, it's probably going to be cheaper for you, substantially cheaper to send it on chain. For somebody who's sending a micropayment, most definitely going to be cheaper on uh, Lightning Network. 
So you, um, the different use cases will push people to either or. Now, in terms of do I think this is a result of LN, um, I'm going to say pr pretty much no, because I think the usage of LN is very, very small. Um, and the reason for that is that L1 right now, Bitcoin main chain, um, is settling and working through everyone's transaction just fine. Um, we really haven't had an enormous fee spike or any reason to get off mainnet. Um, uh, you know, we're all a patient bunch after going through two years of bearish territory. Um, we've all got pretty patient in, uh, in, in waiting for that block confirmation. Um, what that looks like longer term is more pressing. I actually would think that Tether is the number one reason for this. Um, I think that the amount of volume, and you can actually see this because the Ethereum blockchain is full right now. You can't get anything transacted on uh, on Ethereum for less than you know five five gas or something, and to be honest, any Ethereum transaction is now much much higher than what Bitcoin's was back here. You're talking about two three dollar transactions sometimes, um, and to be honest, it's good for the Ethereum chain, right? That's that that that's a bullish signal. It's what you want to see, but it's also going to be good for Ethereum's competitors when people come in and they go, oh, the fees are too high. You know, we're going to go through all of that cycle again. So you know, the the fee network and everything is is part of this whole mix. But I do think that this beast is the main reason for a lot of this falling off chain, and it kind of makes you question how much of this was him. Thank you for that. Um, we've just had a question from Josh um, uh, asking about whether or not the DEX uh, may have an impact uh, similarly um, in terms of you know it being atomic swaps on the Lightning Network, I believe is is the essence of why he's asking that question. Correct me yep. if I'm wrong. So, yeah, yeah, so both, both DEX and Lightning uh, will both have on-chain signatures. Um, so yes, they will most certainly be um, in, you know, they, they will be accounting for some of the blocks based demand. And remember, miners don't particularly care what the transaction was as long as you paid a fee. And all of those will be paying a fee. Um, what I like about Decred is that the way it's been designed, and, you know, this has always been some of the critique, for, um, you know, positive critique coming from many of the developer community when they look at Dave Collins and, um, and the Decred developers' core code, is it's so modular that you can basically implement any feature that you want, right? Bitcoin kind of started as Satoshi code and um, it's, it's kind of been built up and built up and built up and optimized and they can't hard fork. And there's lots of technical debt that gets built in. There's lots of optimizations that they do. Um, you know, very, very smart guys work. Um, but you need to remember that there's a lot of technical debt that's been built into that system because it's 11 years old um, and it doesn't have a hard fork mechanism. Um, for Decred, we can, basically fork in any feature optimization, new technology, whatever it is, there's a mechanism to get to those pathways using hard forks. And it's very likely that there will be a, a very good balance struck between fees um, and current blocks based demand. Um, you know, I mean, you could go as, as, as far fetched as you want, but you could, you could even have decrib with uh, dynamic block sizes, dynamic fees. You could, you know, there's any number of things you could do with the decred chain because of its flexibility. Um, to manage whatever the future looks like when it comes to survivability and preserving that 21 cap. And, you know, it's one of those things that um, Bitcoin relies on the market almost exclusively for everything. Now, that's good, right? Gold relies on the market. It's been very sound for a long time. But this is software. It does need to change. It does need to evolve. And it's a huge bull case for me on Decred is it can adapt to whatever is coming. And we don't know what's coming. Uh, I bet you no one knew what was coming in 2020. Um, we're going to have plenty of these in the future. And Decred needs to be able to survive. Uh, and Bitcoin needs to be able to survive a thousand years of this. And being able to adapt to a thousand, I mean, I often ask myself, is Bitcoin ready for a thousand years if it ossified today? No, no way. There's a lot of things that need to change and adapt and evolve between now and then. Now, that's not to say that Bitcoin won't get there. It can't do it. And the market won't find a way. But it's certainly got a bit of a handicap in that it needs to deal with uh, everything without using hard forks. Um, Decred, on the other hand, can update itself and self-amend uh, to basically deal with whatever the future holds. And to me, that's that's really what this this chain in particular, um, aside from its in, in incredible design and security, that that's what gets me in. Is it's I think Decred will be able to um, long term. Bitcoin relies on the market to produce twenty one million. 
Decred can basically do whatever it needs to do to preserve that 21 million. I think Decred is actually better equipped long term to support a 21 million hard cap into the infinite future. A bullish statement, but that's that's my gut feel deep down. Thank you for that. Just a bit of clarity. I've just noticed in chat that um, Josh has emphasized, um, well, he's just added another question. Do you see much, if any, of a value proposition for minimally differentiated Bitcoin forks, such as Litecoin, as well as BSV, BCH, etc., in a world where Decred exists as a sufficiently differentiated alternative to B BTC? I mean, my question is, what does Litecoin, Bcash, BSV, what are, what are they differentiated on? Right. To be perfectly honest, they haven't actually differentiated in any way, shape or form. Um, Decred took everything that Bitcoin has held near and dear and bet against it. Right. Decred is the most differentiated. And again, this is all my opinion, but Decred is the most differentiated coin in the entire space um, from Bitcoin. And we're talking when I talk about that, I'm talking about the, uh, you know, the 21 million class, right? The coins that have tried to be that that fixed cap supply store of value. Um, even if you look at some of the strong competitors, you know, the Zcashers of the world, um, they've got privacy, but they've got a challenge, like they've, they've already had their challenges with governance. Um, you know, Bcash and BSV and Litecoin, what did they change really? I, I don't know, to be perfectly honest. I don't really see, if, I mean, um, Bitcoin's biggest value proposition, and this could also be a bit controversial, um, Bitcoin's biggest value proposition and moat is liquidity and reputation. Everything else completely replaceable, and I—I I, I mean, sorry, proof of work. You can you can hang on to, but really, what what is Bitcoin at its core? If I was to push every Bitcoiner, I reckon, and you you go as hard as you can on what you were willing to change, people will be willing to change the hashing algorithm. People will be willing to change which ASICs it uses. People will be willing to change pretty much anything when push comes to shove, except the twenty-one million hard cap. All right, people won't budge on that. Um, pure proof of work consensus. Um, that's that's Bitcoin. That is what Bitcoin is, and and the rest of it is the UTXO set. Everything else with Bitcoin, and I know Andreas has said this in the past as well, and I, I you know I could be um, amalgamating his views here, but um, everything else is, is negotiable, right? You could change all the other stuff, um, and you, it's still Bitcoin. Um, when you you know, and that's why with with you know changing the block size or changing it from twenty one to eighty four million, who cares? Um, what Decred has done is it's brought in. An entirely new consensus mechanism with a very, very different set of ledger assurances. Um, and to be honest, it's it's when you actually look at the the security of Decred, um, I'm going to go out on a limb and say in this bull market, Decred will become the most secure chain. It really doesn't need much of a bid. It really doesn't need much of a price point, and Decred will absolutely be the most secure chain. There's there's just nothing else out there that compares because of the logarithmic and the exponential curve. Um, that it has in its security budget. And even the most feasible attack vector is completely infeasible. Um, the amount of ASICs you need is just crazy. So it, it, it differentiated on the governance, it differentiated on, the, on the, uh, the funding model, it differentiated on the security mechanism, it layered human consensus over machine consensus. There's so many elements that it did not only well, um, but in all in a package, right? It did all of these things. It is the most differentiated uh, equivalent to Bitcoin, um, it can implement privacy. If we need ZK snarks, we implement ZK snarks, right? It doesn't really matter. Zcash can do that, but Zcash cannot implement hybrid consensus. Bitcoin cannot implement hybrid consensus. It completely changes the whole model. You have to start with these things from the early days. And the distribution is actually really, really important for that reason as well. And that's why we're looking at, that's why I went fairly deep looking at the uh, decred mining behavior because it really, really matters with hybrid consensus and a governance model, what the coin distribution is. And when I did, I think it was my, my last paper, um, which is on Medium, um, when I looked at what was going on during that early mining period, um, and even during, the, in fact, for the entirety of Decred's history, you've either had Ethereum miners who didn't care, just sell the coins, or you've had ASIC miners who were like, my God, I need to keep the lights on, sell it all. Both of those cases have distributed coins everywhere. So. The markets had every opportunity that they want to go and buy every coin. Um, so to me, that that's really promising. And uh, yeah, I, I personally don't understand the market valuation of the vast majority of the coins in this space. 
Um, and it's really why I see deep credit is just, it's just unbelievably undervalued on that metric alone, just solely based on um, the differential properties and um, the ability to, uh, you know, give Bitcoin as a headache as they try to understand what could be wrong about their model. It's good fun. Fantastic. We've got one more question here from Josh, actually. Um, what do you see as the primary barriers to decred unseating unnecessary forks like LTC, BCH that currently sit among the top 10 by market capitalization? Um, the, the true answer is um, liquidity and attention. And the actual answer, in my opinion, is a whole lot of people um, on Twitter or on whatever social platform you are talking about it. The thing that Decred lacks is people banging on about it and saying, you know what, I really support this chain and I believe in it. Um, I know there's lots of maximalists who have bags of Decred, but they just don't like to talk about it. Um, and I love egging them on because I know who they are, right? There's lots of people, um, the more people who sing about this, I mean, there's so many chains that just get by on zero fundamentals, but have lots of people singing about it. Um, and people, you know, as we move into a, a bullish market, the reality is we just need to sing about what we do. Um, and, you know, the decred contractors, people who own the coins, um, it just needs attention. Um, with attention comes, uh, you know, um, exchange volume. I'll get these charts live is because I want traders to get on board. Um, there's so many signals that you can pull out short, medium, long term from DCR and get legitimate um, good entries and good exits. I want people buying and selling it. I want people with, I want to derivatives for decred and options and futures and things. So miners, contractors and stakers, right? The three supply side uh, entities, we need them to hedge their risk. If you're a contractor, you want to be selling futures just the same as a miner. They just need to hedge their income. Um, and the more people that sing about it, the more um, physical attention that the network gets from people just talking about it. Um, and, and the more, you know, enthusiasm and excitement that comes out of it, all the liquidity and you know people banging on about it and to be honest a whole bunch of speculators noobs and dgens trading the thing that's what we need um and as soon as i mean decred's only weakness as far as i'm concerned is a 10 in the community on those things unstoppable there's no way any of these other coins will be able to survive particularly if their block rewards go to zero and miners just go yeah i'm done There's actually yeah. one more point to that. Um, as yeah. all of these, as the halvings occur, which for you know Bitcoin is about to happen, there's a whole lot of miners, S9s, and this occurs for any proof of work chain. Um, your field, right? If you're not Bitcoin and you're top of your field um, in the hash power department, all those miners, and look, this is a prediction of mine. We'll see if it comes true. Every single miner that drops off the B table, they're definitely not going to be profitable on Bitcoin Cash or BSV. Where's the next place that you turn those ASICs, which are paperweights, in any other? Do you just put them in the bin? If you've paid them off, maybe. If you haven't, why don't you start out of fifth at a big old short position um, and you undermine the security of those networks and you make money to the downside? Now, I don't know if this is going to play out, but when ASICs, if, then, if they have not paid themselves off, they're going to go looking for profit sort of an ASIC network, if you're not top of your field, if you're not king of the pitch, when those ASICs get kicked off your network because of the difficulty adjustment and your block reward halving, um, they're going to go looking for profit. And the cheapest way to do it, if it's mining not so honestly with a big short position. So we will see how these other coins fare as their block rewards halve and get smaller. Um, we are deep in, uh, you know, when 90% coins mined for a lot of these these projects, um, they don't have much ammunition to boot bootstrap left and if top of the field then I wouldn't be holding it and this you know I, I would not recommend anybody touch minority change because you know as much as people like to say oh but incentives well incentives work until they don't and when they don't your chain's gone That's fantastic. Um, I, I I love how you go in depth on the on the fundamentals of the not only the chain obviously but also the mining um, attitudes uh, in practice. 
Um, you know, I, was it a couple of weeks ago I saw on Twitter there was someone who posted something about active addresses uh, and as, using it as a signal as to, you know, when people hate Bitcoin, that's the time to buy. And when people love Bitcoin, that's the time to sell. And love and hate is defined by active addresses. Um, but I feel like, what, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, that's more sort of short term, I guess. But this is, I guess, uh, what, you've, what you've presented to me is more of a long term view um, and, and long term hindsight. Like active addresses and transaction counts and things there. The problem with those is that they're um, subject to a lot of noise. So when you look at, for example, Decred um, active addresses, um, if you didn't realize that every privacy mix additional address for everybody in every ticket transaction you have the one where they combine the coins and then the spend um, you would look at it and go wow look at all those active addresses but it's actually a technical thing same as a coin join right if you're running a coin join on Bitcoin right they just it, it's it's coins being mixed and uh, there's a whole lot of other things going on that are not that you know one of those or you know 15 of those addresses could be one guy so um, there's fairly simplistic metrics like just looking at transaction counts and active addresses. They're useful, but there's no psychology behind it. And that's where on-chain analysis differs is, you know, granted that is on-chain analysis, but um, really what you're looking for is um, what is the psychology and who really moves the needle? The people who move the needles are the smart money investors at the bottom, the miners capitulating or hodling, um, in Decred's case, contractors and stakeholders, right, and miners, who actually moves the needle on these things and has a genuine impact on supply and demand um, dynamics, and that's where you'll find your answer. If it's just people moving coins around, there's, there's, you know, NVT immediately tells you a whole lot more um, because you're comparing it to a baseline. Is it settling enough value relative to what it's worth? Is it overvalued relative to what it's currently doing? So. You know, it's it's a fairly simplistic and crude model that um you know uh, it would probably work, but I wouldn't be uh, I wouldn't be basing any um, significant analysis on it. Right. Thank you so much. Um, there's a lot of information here to unpack, particularly if you are new to um, on-chain analysis. You did mention at the beginning of this that um, you have been doing some. Some, was it the masterclass on Ready Set Crypto? Uh, yeah, so there's about four or five on RSC's YouTube channel. Um, if you can't find it, just ping me something on uh, on Twitter, and I'll I'll get back to you and link you to it. But it's in a playlist uh, that we've got up there. Fantastic. And um, there's, so as you said, there was um, public, uh, you know, broadcasts that are published, and then there's also some private ones that are behind a paywall. Um, I know that. Uh, the rest of Decred Australia are organizing a few more sorts of shows for you. And um, I think, you know, it's so much information to to put into one session. And uh, like you said also in the beginning, that maybe if we had a few more of these uh, a little bit more frequently, we can sort of focus on, on certain points a little bit more. Um, in particular, you know, if there's people who are just joining us and, 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 and it's the first time they're really looking at on-chain analysis, um, it's very, very valuable. Um, but you know, it may take time for it to sink in for some people. So it'd be great to have a few more of those sorts of sessions together if you're if you're up for it. And um, obviously, this time around, we had more people join. Uh, and I know that a lot of other people tried to join, but as soon as we started recording this session, um, the system just won't let randoms join. So we had to individually ask people to send us their emails to invite them to join once the recording had begun. So maybe we'll look into another system for the next one. Um, so that we can record it because we did get asked for that last time we did one of these sessions. Um, and yes, we can see now on on the screen there, we've got some links if people want to um, look for that. Uh, in addition to these links, um, we've recently just launched a, a Decred Australia Facebook page. It's funny, I find that in Australia at least, um, there's less people using Twitter uh, and, and it's more Facebook. Um, and so we decided to start a, a Decred Australia Facebook page and we do post um, the general Decred information, but we also um, post uh, content that's more relevant to Australia's as well, particularly if it's something to do with events or something to do with the Australian economy. 
um, something that's happening in Australia. So that there is facebook.com slash decredau. So decredau is how you find our page. Uh, and for those of you who came and found us on Meetup, um, we do have a Decred Australia Meetup as well. Um, beyond that, feel free to catch us on other social media platforms. Uh, we have Decred Australia on Twitter. Uh, and uh, obviously Checkmates on Twi Twitter. He's an Australian that's on Twitter pretty actively, which is good. <laughs> it's a bit quiet in our time zone. I'm uh, hoping to liven things up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's um, you, you really got to come to one of our live events once this whole COVID uh, experience, let's call it, is, is over so you can see what it's like um, and you can get a vibe for the attitudes and the education level that we generally get in um, the more sort of larger public events. Um, as you can tell yourself, I mean, the content that you present here is um, is quite in depth. And I think one of the points with Decred uh, for it to sort of get that sort of attention you're talking about is that it requires people to really be understanding of what money really is fundamentally and then the rest of it before it's about people sort of seeing about its praises and, 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 you know, just people blindly following something like, you know, the hype of 2017 with uh, Bitcoin and the, the, the other alts. Um, there's plenty more that I could say in, 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 in my view as to what um, would attract more people to, to decred, particularly the Bitcoin maximus, maximalists, but I think maybe we'll leave that for next time. Um, please hit us up, whoever is still online uh, on social media, and um, we look forward to more the next time we have all of you on. Thank you so much. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. Appreciate it. Thanking you. Talk soon, guys. Thank you. Decred is secure, adaptable, sustainable. Learn more at decred.org.